first of all, there was this comment made earlier, I think, by uh, Tom about the need for monitoring. And I mean, this I see also in oceanography that, um, and also in the satellite observations that, that uh, let's say NASA puts up a satellite, it's experimental, there's money for it, but then you want to keep it going for decades and decades and it's not, uh, you know, people say, well, it's the hypothesis you're testing and so on. And so there's really a need for resources for continued monitoring. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is, you know, one of the things we just saw from this last uh, talk was that there's a huge uncertainty in regional scale climate predictions. And so for land managers and, and marine managers, I think the reality is that there's a situation of needing to plan under uncertainty and think in terms of how do we increase robustness and resilience uh, of uh, natural and human systems. And, uh, you know, and say, so for coral reefs, I'm mostly going to talk about chemistry, but, you know, there's all kinds of stresses on coral reefs, including overfishing, the pressures of tourism, and so on. And, and any stresses uh, that can be diminished on these natural systems increases their probability of withstanding these new stresses that we're imposing on these systems. And so, um, anyway, that's that. I guess the last thing I wanted to say before I started this is that, you know, I do have a tendency to make sort of statements about what we ought to do, and I just want to make it clear that, that uh, you know, as scientists, I think our, our job is to say what the facts are and what we see about the world, but, uh, you know, we're not only scientists, we're also citizens, and as citizens, we, we get to say, you know, what we think we should do, but just to make it clear that, you know, that some of what I will say falls into my role as scientist and some is a, a sort of a semi-informed citizen. Okay, uh, just before, I, yet, yet more preamble. Uh, we just had a paper come out in Geophysical Research Letters, and the question was if you, I mean, there's a few questions we addressed in this paper, but one was if I drive my car home today, what additional global warming is resulting from that additional release of CO2? And so we did, among other things in this paper, a bunch of, uh, what we call pulse release experiments. We just put an initial, a little pulse of CO2, and then you know, that decays away with time as it gets absorbed by the ocean and the land biosphere and so on. But what happens with the warming, with really big pulses, it takes many decades to get up to full warming. But with small pulses, you know, we're talking a decade or two or three or, or so of warming. But then essentially, it stays warm for many centuries and it finally tails off over millennia. And, and, uh, and so to a first approximation, you could think of each release of CO2 as being a stepwise, is causing a stepwise increase in temperatures that persist for, you know, many centuries, if not millennia. And so the, you know, the idea that, that, that it's a, something that goes away very quickly just isn't correct. Let me just... Okay, so I am going to be focusing on on uh, chem chem a bit of chemical oceanography. And so I'm going to do a little cartoon of chemistry first just to get you oriented. And so coral, first of all, coral reefs are made out of, is this working here? Coral reefs are made out of calcium carbonate. Most carbon dioxide in the ocean is in the form of this, what's called bicarbonate ion. So you can see sort of a CO2 with some piece of a water molecule. And then some of it is in the form of carbonate ions, again, which is CO2 with an oxygen stuck on it. And that's what corals and other organisms use to build their shells and skeletons. And so what happens to when we add CO2 to this system? Well, if we, that's the CO2 molecule. When the CO2, so the first thing that happens is the CO2 molecule combines with a water molecule. But in the pH conditions of, ocean, of the ocean, this is unstable, and one of these protons or hydrogen ions pops off. And so when we talk about the pH of the ocean, or the P, what you're talking about is a measure of the concentration of these hydrogen ions or protons, essentially. And, uh, and so th this is becoming more common, and in the weird negative log world of pHs, that means the pH is getting lower. And the, this can directly interact uh, with, with uh, 
cells of marine organisms and have its own uh, consequences, as can the CO2. But the part that's been most studied is the effect of this increased hydrogen ion activity or concentration on the carbonate ions and what that means for the shells and skeletons of marine organisms. Because this goes over and reacts with the carbonate ion, removing it uh, and making it not available as a building block for the corals and increasing this bicarbonate ion concentration. And because of chemical equilibria, if I've re reduced the concentration of this carbonate ion, that's made this now chemically unstable and in high enough concentrations, the coral or whatever the shell is can dissolve. Now, even if you don't actually produce, uh, add enough CO2 to actually dissolve this uh, skeletal material, you decrease the chemical potential that's helping the, the organism build its skeleton and uh, therefore can decrease its ecological competitiveness. Um, okay, so uh, there are two, the two main forms of calcium carbonate found in the ocean are calcite and aragonite. And chemically, they're the same thing. They're all calcium carbonate, but they're different uh, mineral structures. And this one dissolves less easily than this one. And there are a number of tiny microscopic uh, organisms that live on the surface of the ocean that build uh, skeletons or shells out of, uh, out of calcite. And corals, one of the reasons they're particularly vulnerable is they happen to use the more soluble form of calcium carbonate known as aragonite. And so whenever, if I happen to say aragonite or calcite, you can just think, well, it's a form of calcium carbonate. And that's the same limestone or chalk are all made out of that. So the great cliffs of Dover and so on. So, yeah, so, uh, okay, so what did I say already? Is CO2 makes it harder for corals to make their skeletons. Uh, and, you know, we see, um, you know, all kinds of fish gnawing on coral reefs, but it's not, in addition to macro visible type organisms, there's also all kinds of micro burrowing creatures. And, uh, and, and in addition, uh, so they need to produce their skeletons uh, fast enough to keep up with what's known as bioerosion. The other thing to bear in mind is that on the seafloor, there's a constant ecological competition for space. And, uh, you know, so there's algae and seagrasses and so on that want to occupy that same space. And, and so if you're weakening corals, even though you might be able to grow them in a fish tank under some conditions, if they're in ecological competition and you weaken the corals, then they might lose out to these other organisms. So there have been a number of experiments done now. And one of the issues is that these experiments have been done in generally in laboratory conditions where you bring some uh, coral into a fish tank and change the conditions. And um, let me, I'll come back to that later. And so this aragonite saturation state you can think of uh, as the chemical potential that's helping the coral build its skeletal material. And so uh, these numbers are probably too light here. But at the height of the ice age, uh, we were probably somewhere around here that, uh, say, a few hundred years ago at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, we were around here. And today, we're somewhere around here, and we're heading that way. And while there's a fair amount of scatter, you can see that the growth rates of coral skeletal material is uh, basically linearly proportional to this aragonite saturation state or the chemical potential that's helping them build their skeletons. Now, uh, I mean, one thing that's interesting is this curve, while it's experimentally determined, is still not understood from a biophysical perspective that nobody can really explain from a sort of biomechanical model why this relationship should attain this exact functional form. But it seems to be a fairly robust result. So as I said before, that you need to calcify fast enough uh, to ex exceed the bioerosion in order for the corals to uh, exist and also to, for the, they need to grow fast enough to be ecologically competitive. And so the, the dominant areas where you find uh, corals in nature are areas where this number here, this aragonite saturation state, is greater than four. There's some in this zone here, but basically no corals are found. Um, 
uh, where the aragonite saturation state is less than three. So the assumption is, and we, I'll sort of, this is not universally agreed upon, but that, that the likelihood of their, that they be able to compete ecologically for a sustained amount of time when the aragonite saturation is less than three, I think, is at least uh, open to suspect. Now, this is a global sort of average number. The, the, just to say where you are here, the, you reach this point here on a global average basis when atmospheric CO2 reaches twice its uh, pre-industrial concentration, which, uh, you know, with current trends might be sometime around mid-century. So to get a little more, oh yeah, I guess I showed some figures before of this, but it's, well, I'm focusing this discussion on corals. There are plenty of other organisms, and including mollusks and uh, echinoderms and all kinds of other uh, uh, creatures that, uh, that use calcium carbonate for their shells or skeletons. Here's, here's an echinoderm one. The, the, uh, um, Shiro, Shiroyama in Japan did these experiments. And the other thing, most of these experiments, as I say, have been done in lab conditions, often over very relatively short periods of time. This is actually one of the longer experiments going for six months. And uh, he looked at sea urchin growth uh, under what was, uh, the, this was the 380 ppm atmosphere, which we now live under, and looking at how fast the uh, sea urchins were growing, and then looking at sort of 580, so adding 200 ppm, which is a little more than a doubling, and basically saw uh, no growth. And not only what, did they have thinner shells, but their bodies uh, weren't growing as fast, which uh, basically if you try, I need to calcify when there's, the, the seawater around you is less conducive to calcifying. The organism needs to put in more metabolic energy to, to producing its shell, and then it has less metabolic resources left over for growing its body and reproducing and everything else. So, so people have not looked at almost any organism through its full reproductive cycle. I'm not aware of any organism, at least multicellular, that's uh, looked at. And so, you know, there's still a question. People are now starting to do experiments on uh, on, uh, you know, what it might do to fish larvae or other uh, 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 sort of sensitive components, sensitive phases of um, life cycles. Adult fish are, you know, the interest, the fluids inside an adult fish, say, are, are pretty well regulated just the way our blood chemistry is well regulated. And it's really things like when you have eggs or, or, or sea urchins or or squid, or different kind of organisms where their body fluids are not well chemically separated for the, from the ocean, that there's greater concern about what this might do to the organism. So um, uh, now I'm going to go in and you're going to see a few slides that you saw earlier today, but it doesn't hurt to repeat a few important things. And this are those IPCC scenarios uh, that we heard about, and I won't go through all the scenarios. But uh, you know, one thing to know is that Atmospheric CO2 uh, concentrate, um, emissions went up by a factor of six, say, over the last century. And, you know, if they go right now, we're already hitting around not fossil fuels plus land cover change. We're up to about 10 billion tons a year. And so if it goes up another six times in the next century, then we're up to 60 uh, billion tons a year, which is somewhere up here. And so you know, many people are now starting to look at these IPCC scenarios as being overly optimistic. Almost all of these scenarios assume that we're going to spontaneously give up coal in, in, and, and replace coal with uh, renewables, that, uh, and, and the actual trend has been towards increased use of coal. They also all assume that if you become more efficient, you use less energy. The famous case is the Watt's invention of the steam engine. When he made a more efficient steam engine, the use of coal skyrocketed because then you could efficiently provide those energy services at low cost. And so sometimes efficiency can actually lead to increased fossil fuel use. And, and so these scenarios were based on a whole set of optimistic uh, uh, outlooks that just might not be right. But anyway, that said, just uh, to give you ballpark numbers, that's most of the centerpiece of these scenarios maybe has a doubling of CO2 sometime around mid-century, maybe a tripling of pre-industrial CO2 sometime around the end of the century. We saw this figure before. The, I don't have it put, posted on here, 
but the 2006 numbers are around 8.4 uh, gigatons or billions of tons of carbon per year. So we're up here. Uh, and, and so the, uh, you know, the, again, the trajectory see, uh, seems to be much worse than what the IPCC scenarios were predicting. And part of that is underestimating the uh, rapid growth in China and India, and also the high oil prices are pushing people towards increased use of coal, which is the least, which is the most carbon intensive fossil fuel available. So a number of people have looked at different stabilization pathways saying, okay, what would it take to stabilize at 450, 550, 650 parts per million? And so we looked at those also. Uh, and uh, then looked at what the, con the, the um, consequences for ocean chemistry were. So, okay, sorry this is sort of a global talk, but Hawaii does happen to appear in the middle of the slide here. So, the, um, so this is 280 ppm is more or less the atmospheric CO2 concentration in parts per million about 200 years ago. And the, what's represented in the colors here is this aragonite saturation, which again is can be thought of as the chemical potential force that's helping, uh, or at least the difference between this and one is proportional to the chemical potential that would help a coral reef uh, build its skeleton. Below one means that the waters actually would dissolve uh, aragonite, the, the, the kind of calcium carbonate that corals are made out of. And so what you can see, here's a, a frequency chart of coral reefs, and you can, so you can see that something like two-thirds of the coral reefs pre-industrially were in this four times, and then uh, I think almost all of them with just one or two little exceptions are at this sort of 3.25 or over. And so the first thing is to say, well, how have things changed just from pre-industrial to present? And so if we, this is the situation today. And, uh, you know, so remember that um, before, uh, you know, basically the, the core of the coral area was four times greater. There was nothing in the yellows, uh, you know, that, that, that uh, you know, if we just to, to look a little more closer on what's going on with, uh, with uh, in the Hawaiian region, you know, so you were well over four before, to, by today, the average saturation is probably something closer to, to three and a half. And, um, and the, you know, remember pre-industrially there was no corals or, or just maybe one or two coral reefs found below 3.25. So, you know, so one of the, the things that comes up in this research is if you look at, the, say, the pre-industrial distribution, you have to say, well, okay, that means over thousands of years that coral reefs, that's where coral reefs were able to uh, to compete successfully ecologically. And just because, but in a fish tank, you can grow a coral in almost any kind of seawater. But, uh, you know, the fact, but that's isolated from ecological competition. And so you have to say, well, uh, and that's also not to say that if you do decrease the saturation state for some short amount of time, that, uh, that the reef, since it's already occupying that space, might persist. But, uh, you know, if a disturbance should come, say there's some kind of hurricane or, or a storm that, that's disruptive to the reef, then, you know, it might be that the algaes come in and compete, uh, you know, when it comes time to, to sort of reoccupy the space that the, 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 the coral reef system might not be able to reoccupy that space. So again, so here's 450 ppm. This is uh, now sort of probably in, in just a few decades from now. We're going up around two, over 2 ppm per year now. So what would that be, 70, 35 years? So maybe, well, no, we'll say, anyway, it's, it's a few decades from now. So you're already into the zone where uh, coral reefs are generally not found in the pre-industrial ocean. By 550 ppm, uh, you know, then you're well down here in the state where coral reefs didn't exist uh, in nature. And so even holding atmospheric CO2 concentrations to a doubling of pre-industrial values, which is what many people think of as a, an appropriate target for climate purposes, or, you know, puts uh, most of the coral reefs of the world outside uh, 
the range where coral reefs were found before the advent of the Industrial Revolution. Remember this blue band shows the sort of range in which of seawater chemistry uh, where corals were found uh, a few hundred years ago. And uh, you know, this set is the distribution of the, the chemistry surrounding those reefs under a 550 ppm ocean. And those two sets are basically disjoint. The other thing to notice is over here, you've got these colors indicating that the shells of some marine organisms are, are dissolving. I know this is not Hawaii. It's rather cold down there. But, uh, but uh, there's um, marine mollusks known as pteropods that consume a lot of the uh, uh, photosynthetic uh, production, uh, unicellular photosynthetic production in those areas, and then get grazed upon by higher organisms in the uh, food chain, and some people have estimated, I don't know how reliable these estimates are, but that these pteropods might consume 50% of the primary production in those ecosystems. And you know, it's not known, really, if you lose uh, these organisms, will something else take that ecological role? Will the ecosystem be unaffected, or w will it make a profound change in the ecosystem? So, but we are making profound changes in ocean chemistry. I guess that's my point. And we really don't know how this is going to play out in, in, in a broader ecosystem perspective. But, the, but at least from the perspective of coral reefs, things are looking rather grim. You know, so this is then just taking this up to higher and higher levels. And you know, basically, the story remains the same. Again, here was what things looked like pre-industrially. Here's where we are today. And uh, you know that. And 750 ppm is somewhere around where we are by end of century, uh, um, you know, with the business as usual scenario. And you've got vast areas of the polar oceans where, where the shells are just uh, would just dissolve. But the the uh, you know pretty much the, the entire ocean ha has conditions that that. At least there's no evidence that can, can sustainably support uh, coral reefs. Uh, again, it's the same sort of chart, but just showing you the bar charts now. And I guess I've belabored the point enough. You know, this is the distribution pre-industrially, and say even by 550 ppm, there's maybe you have a few little things left by 650. Uh, again, that's not saying when we hit 650, all these reefs will be gone, but I think you have to say that it's questionable whether they're sustainable. enough of that. Okay, so just to say how unusual this is, that, um, okay, the oceans um, are, the surface of the oceans are saturated with respect to carbonate minerals, which means that the, the um, there's the, the sort of the chemistry of the surface water helps mollusks and corals and so on build their shells and skeletons. Whereas the deepest ocean is uh, corrosive, or, or, or in the deepest ocean regions, the, the, these minerals dissolve. And so I'm just going to direct you to this right chart here. So this is showing like sort of depth in the ocean in kilometers by year. So the ocean average depth is around four kilometers. The, uh, and what we see here is, uh, so this line here, I'll just like to direct you to the difference between the yellow and the red and the oranges, and the oranges thing, the, um, this is calcite, the less soluble form is dissolving, and he here it's not dissolving. And so even, say, under 450 ppm, which is kind of the numbers, the sort of most, anyway, that would be a very ambitious target. Even with that, sort of the surface, or the, the depth at which the uh, calcite starts dissolving comes up below a kilometer. And uh, you know, by the time these higher things, it's coming up to a few hundred meters. And so the th reason why this is interesting is because we can, people have done, taken ships and drilled cores into ancient seafloor. And we could see from what kind of sediments are there whether the deep ocean was saturated or not and to what de depth it was saturated. And, and so remember, so here, even in our optimistic scenario, we're going sort of from four kilometers to one kilometer. If we look at, at what's been derived from various cores in the, uh, this is from the Equatorial Pacific Ocean cores, the Atlantic and Pacific, we can see, you know, so today it's, uh, you know, somewhere around this sort of four plus kilometer range and, uh, you know, varying by basin. Uh, 
but that for the last 50 million years, uh, you know, it hasn't gone above, say, two and a half or th three kilometers deep. And, you know, I just said that even if we do our most optimistic uh, scenario, it's, going, it's coming up, uh, you know, to one kilometer deep. So it would be like this curve right now is going to go up to there somewhere. And these curves are going to go up to there somewhere. And so what we're doing to the ocean chemistry is something that hasn't been done to ocean chemistry uh, in the last 50 million years. Even in that PETM event that was mentioned uh, in the first talk, uh, that uh, there's no evidence that the surface waters became corrosive enough to actually dissolve uh, shells of marine organisms. So we saw this curve earlier also, um, and that, you know, this is this. Uh, um, from the Vostok uh, record, the, this ice core, that little air bubbles were trapped in the ice, and people measured the atmospheric CO2, and you see these kind of, uh, of uh, variations. And then this is the recent record, and which mostly was done at Mauna Loa here. The, um, I, I, well, one, one little sort of interesting point is the minimum of this record is something around 190 ppm. We've just recently hit 380 ppm. So if you're thinking in terms of from the depth of the last glacial maximum, we've actually now reached about one doubling of atmospheric CO2. Now the, and, so, and so you might say, well, as an index of how much a doubling of CO2 would climate change would produce on the multi-thousands of years time scale, that's probably your estimate is that's like the difference between the middle of the ice age and today. Now the difference, of course, is that the ice sheets take many thousands of years to equilibrate, uh, like to melt the whole entire East Antarctic ice sheet will probably take, you know, over 5,000 years if, if indeed we ever melt it. So, um, and so the actual, uh, so the sort of the century scale climate sensitivity is probably something like half that multi-millennial scale climate sensitivity. So you might think of that doubling CO2 might be more or less on the century time scale, something like half the difference between the ice age and today. And then if you wait 10,000 years and you keep emitting CO2, it might be on the same order of magnitude. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. I don't know how to get out of that. Oh, yeah, so one of the things is sometimes you show these kind of curves and people, you know, this looks like a sort of straight line, that looks like a straight line, and, it's a, and people say, oh, well, you know, didn't we do this kind of thing before? Didn't this kind of thing happen before? So what are we worrying about? So if you look at the rates of change of atmospheric CO2, and so what it is, just took each point from that previous slide and say, okay, uh, you know, what is the rate of change in atmospheric CO2 concentration? Take, you know, each constant, each, uh, the, you know, the difference in time and the difference in CO2 concentration between subsequent measurements and divide them, you get rates that are typically a few hundredths of a ppm per year. If you take the uh, record from Mount Oloa, first of all, it's, it's trending up. So now, it, you know, was, uh, when they first started, it was increasing about one ppm per year. Now it's, uh, you know, something like two and a half ppm per year. And, you know, so if we put those two things on the same plot that, you know, with a few tiny outliers, which I'm not sure exactly where they're from, but the, uh, you know, that, you know, that, that the changes that we're doing today are typically a hundred times more rapid than uh, natural variation. And I think the same point was made with respect to climate change, that the rates of change are, are, are really huge when compared with the natural background. And when you say two degrees uh, per Celsius per century, well, here in an island place, it doesn't make that much sense. But if you think of isotherms uh, moving poleward, right, you can think of like the 20 degree line or moving towards the pole as, as uh, the planet warms up, that the rate that at two degrees per century in the mid latitudes works out to about 10 meters per day. So that, you know, that's, or, you know, which for American type units is 30 feet a day, something like that. And so if you think that, well, to keep up with a temperature band that organisms would need, you know, or would need to move 10 meters a day, that that's a really rapid change. It's the kind of thing that squirrels can do well, but oak trees might not do well at. So the canonical number for how much CO2 fossil fuel resources there are, as put forward by the IPCC, is around 5,000 billion tons, which, uh, and, and then, so we did the scenarios of, well, what would happen if we burn all of it? And um, 
or then let's say we just burnt half of it or, or sequestered the other half or, or left it or three quarters. And then there's also these non-traditional carbon rich shales or, or methane hydrates on the shelves. And so we just did a big range of well, what would happen to atmospheric CO2 under a wide range of scenarios. And just to put this in context, well, I, I use the wonders of PowerPoint to try to get this curve I showed before of the Vostok plus the Mauna Loa record onto the same scale. And if we put that on the same scale, that, that's the sort of glacial, glacial, interglacial variations. And this is what, what we have the potential to do in, in the next decades and centuries. And so, and, and as I said, even that 450 ppm brought the ocean to conditions that hadn't been seen uh, at least for 50 million years, and I would contend for 65 million years, that you know, these kind of conditions really make oceans unlike, ocean chemistry <coughs> unlike, uh, you know, well, anyway, I'll go to the next thing here. So, yeah, so here's, um, you know, so here's those atmospheric CO2 levels again. This is another sort of just an indication. These are two different indications of what atmospheric CO2 has been like over the last 20 plus million years. And um, one of these is based on um, estimating um, uh, um, the, uh, I, looking at estimating CO2, dissolved molecular CO2 from isotopic fractionation. Another one of them is a pH-based uh, isotopic fractionation method on boron isotopes. And each of these methods have their own problems, but when you have two different methods that are based on different systems, both saying the same thing, then you say, well, they might be right. And both, so again, this is a lot, so the idea is if they're both saying there hasn't been a big change, maybe there hasn't been a big change. So it's a log scale, so 100, 200, 300. So we're 380 is today. And so basically, um, you know, that there's been no uh, record, no, no real evidence that it's been substantially high, atmospheric CO2 has been substantially higher than today for the last 20 million years. And so this is, you know, if we're, uh, you know, so even in these sort of cases where we sequester or don't burn three quarters of the fossil fuels or, you know, we're still going way outside the range uh, of experience that most species have evolved in. Um, yeah, to, to, again, this is back to that same issue of we're doing things too fast by a factor of 100 or so. That um, I, I, I should have had a slide of the global carbon cycle, but the, the, the natural system uh, of carbon cycle on Earth has CO2 coming out of volcanoes, mid ocean ridges, hydrothermal springs, and so on. Comes into the atmosphere, uh, you know fertilizes plants and so on. The plants give out organic acids and raise the CO2 concentrations in soils and that results in ions like calcium and magnesium coming out, going down the rivers, and then put things like coral reefs can take that calcium and take the CO2 and put them together and build their skeletons. And so the long-term uh, uh, trend is for CO2 to come out of volcanoes and wind up in the skeletons of marine organisms. And the, uh, but the rate at which that occurs is something like, uh, uh, you know, a tenth of a petagram of carbon per year. And we're, you know, putting out 8.4 petagrams of carbon in terms of fossil fuels, and then another one and a half or so from, primarily from deforestation. So we're almost putting out 10 petagrams or billions of tons of carbon per year. And the, you know, the natural flux is uh, 0.1. So it's, again, it's just coming to the same thing that we're, we're putting out uh, carbon you know, at a rate that exceeds the, the rate at which the natural systems are, are ready to deal with it by a huge factor. It's thought that in the Cretaceous, when the dinosaurs were around and the Earth was warm, that this volcanic flux might have been twice what it is today, so that it might have been another tenth of a petagram per year sustained over a long time. And so, so and, and if it was another tenth of a petagram per year, then, you know, maybe these weathering reactions and changes in growth of corals and plankton and so on could, uh, could buffer the, those kind of chemical changes. But when it's a factor of 100 change, the, the capacity for the natural systems to buffer these chemical changes is just completely overwhelmed. So, which brings me to what actually was the subject of my dissertation work many years ago, which I didn't think would ever come back to this. But the, um, 
65 million years ago, a, com a comet or a meteor, it's not sure exactly what it was, slammed into the Yucatan Peninsula north of Merida. And this platform was a calcium carbonate platform with a lot of uh, calcium sulfate in it. And as a result of this impact, there was shock metamorphosis. Now, I don't want to say this is an exact analog of what we're doing, because obviously this created sort of nuclear winter type conditions and all kinds of other things that we're not doing, hopefully. Uh, but, um, you know, so it's thought that the amount of CO2 released, uh, well, there's probably something like 50 petagrams, which is sort of 20, 25% of what we've released so far. So that's probably not that much. There's evidence of land mass biomass burning, which could have added a lot more CO2. But I think, um, and so there's also evidence of, from various lines of evidence that atmospheric CO2 levels might have gone up uh, sort of where it, where, uh, it could be if we burn sort of, sort of the full set of fossil fuel resources. That, uh, but also more, perhaps more relevant to the ocean story is that um, there's significant release of uh, sulfur dioxide, which if about 10% of this or so was uh, oxidized and rained down in the ocean, that would have been enough to undersaturate the surface ocean. And, and at that time, um, the, uh, you know, there was a major extinction of, um, of calcareous organisms, organisms that build their shells or skeletons out of calcium carbonate in the ocean. And basically all of the, uh, at that time, all of the, um, uh, or, or nearly all of the plankton that make their shells out of, or tests out of calcium carbonate disappear. Coral reefs disappear from the uh, geologic record at that time. And, but other organisms seem to flourish. I mean, one, diatoms make their shells out of uh, silica or glass, essentially. And they, in many locations, seem to have flourished. Uh, you, know, you could imagine that the nutrients no longer used by the the calcareous organisms can get used by these uh, diatoms and other organisms. Also, dinoflagellates, which are seen in the geologic record because they leave a plastic-like cyst in the sediments, seem to have also flourished. And so, while there seems to be a preferential extinction of organisms that made their shells or skeletons out of calcium carbonate, uh, other organisms that, uh, that didn't require calcium carbonate seem to have flourished. And so the idea that an ocean acidification event preferentially hit the, the, uh, the uh, things that made calcium carbonate skeletons seems to be supported by the geologic evidence. Now, what's interesting is that the reefs did come back about two million years later. It's thought that, first of all, it's thought that the chemistry recovered in some tens of thousands of years. And so the, the time scale for recovery chemically in the ocean is uh, you know, if you think in terms of e-folding time scales, it's probably sort of five or six, seven thousand years, something like that. But so say within a few tens of thousands of years, the ocean's chemically recovered, uh, which is the, I mean, the ocean overturning time scale, let me just say where that comes from. The ocean overturning time scales on the order of a thousand years, but, uh, uh, but a parcel of water, you can think of the water off of the Hawaii somewhere that that parcel of water in its transit, you know, in the grand circulations of the ocean might take a thousand years to come, go down and come back up to the surface. But on any one transit, it's not, it may not interact with the sediments, uh, you know, it might just be in the interior somewhere. And so it takes many, uh, uh, circ you know, many uh, transits through the deep ocean before the, water parcel to become chemically equilibrated with the sediments. And so that's why the, one of the places where that multi-thousand year time scale comes from. But the interesting thing is that it took around two million years for you to, for the coral reefs to reappear, even though we thought that the chemistry recovered in a few tens of thousands of years. Similarly, with, cal with, the, cal with the plankton, it took you know, several hundred thousand years, say 500,000 years, for them to become widespread again. And so it looks like there's a time scale for ecological recovery or evolutionary recovery that, that um, is long relative to the time scale of what we think the chemical disturbance is. Now, the other thing is that when these reefs finally did uh, reappear, around half the species that were around before the boundary 
uh, before this extinction event, uh, re were found again. And, and so um, now in fish tank type experiments, that uh, a coral reef and a sea anemone is almost the same thing, and that uh, sort of a sea anemone is almost like a coral reef without a skeleton. And so while you, you would expect them to be ecologically disadvantaged, it won't kill them off necessarily. And so you could imagine that perhaps these uh, species were existing as minor components in other ecosystems. And then when ch chemical conditions got better, you know, then sort of half of them went extinct, but that half of them managed to eke, eke out in some, perhaps some weird microenvironment or something. And then when conditions got better, they started to repopulate the coast. But it took them around two million years to repopulate the coasts again. And so, you know, what we're doing, uh, you know, so one of the messages here is what we're doing in the next decades has the potential to uh, basically destroy all the coral reefs on the planet. Not saying it will, but I'd say it certainly has the potential to. And then, you know, that the recovery time scale might be something like two million years. And then it took around 10 million years to recover the full level of biodiversity that existed before the boundary. So, you know, so what we're doing in, this dec in these decades has real potential big changes on long time scales. Yeah, so this is this one. So now this is not science, of course, but it's just saying, you know, that basically, uh, you know, I think the planet's going to still grow economically, and we, we sort of are either going to grow with increasing environmental risk or we're going to figure out, well, we're going to try to develop ways to grow without increasing environmental risk or with decreasing environmental risk. And, and um, you know, and I think that uh, this is, I'm done with science here. I'm just sort of going into my own little thing. The, uh, you know, that, you know, I think that we need to conceptualize, well, how do you actually have, allow people to develop and, and have uh, some kind of economy in ways that are, are consistent with um, some kind of, uh, you know, long-term health, environmental health of the planet. And, you know, one thing that actually I have a postdoc working on right now, we did a paper on, is this idea of can we tap into energy from high-altitude winds. Uh, and uh, I don't know, it might be fanciful, but... Uh, you know, I think there are all kinds of technological approaches that could be developed that we haven't approached uh, really developing yet. So again, I'll just sort of leave you on one little depressing note and then my conclusion slides. And just going back to this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, thing here, this is where the distribution was 200 years ago. Again, with uh, you know, basically the greens and blue, blues being sort of the most best conditions for coral reefs, greens being the uh, reasonably good, oops, and then not to hit that button. And then, you know, already, uh, you know, we've already made fairly profound changes to ocean chemistry, and they're just getting uh, more and more profound. And that, e you know, that even a doubling of CO2, while it might not um, look so bad from a climate point of view, from an ocean chemistry point of view, it will create conditions that the oceans haven't seen since the most likely since the dinosaurs have become extinct. And so there's my little slide. So CO2 released to the atmosphere becomes carbonic acid in the oceans. Carbonic acid is corrosive to the shells and skeletons of marine organisms, but its extinctions take tens of thousands of years for ocean chemistry to return to normal. And, you know, that, and it will take you know, then much longer for biota to recover, and that the only practical way to do this is to greatly reduce CO2 emissions soon. What, okay, let's just stop there. Thank you. Questions? What, uh, questions? I have no idea what time it is, so somebody else. Okay. Yes?